Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to learn about light and spectroscopy. We're going to learn about what light is, its various properties, and how spectroscopy is used to study light. Pause the video at this moment to read over the learning objectives so you understand in more detail what we're going to do. So let's first talk about what light is. Light is an electromagnetic wave. It's a form of energy, which we've talked about what energy is already, and it travels at a constant speed called the speed of light. Let's break down a little bit what we mean by electromagnetic wave. First of all, as we can see here, it has a wave-like nature oscillating back and forth. It has valleys and it has peaks, and there's two components of it. There's a magnetic field and an electric field. There's not much you need to know about those two aspects of it other than that's where the term electromagnetic wave comes from. The height of the wave is called the amplitude. And then we also have what's called the wavelength. And the wavelength is the distance between two identical portions of the wave. And so we can look from tip to tip or we can look from trough to trough. You can also go from the midpoint, but where you want to be careful is that we want to compare midpoints that are going the same uh, direction. So here we can see these two midpoints are both going up and to the right, and so this indicates a wavelength. Whereas if we were to measure from here, let's say from A to B here, that would be half of a wavelength, okay? So wavelength is the distance between identical points. Frequency is a little bit harder to visualize, but it tells us how many wavelengths are passing per unit time. And so essentially we might say how long if we want um, one wavelength to pass and it passes in half of a second. That would be one wavelength per 0.5 seconds and so the frequency there is two per second. We see that wavelength and frequency are opposite of each other. They're inversely related through this relationship, which says that the speed of light is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. All types of light are encompassed in what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. This includes gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet or UV light, visible light, which is what we can see, infrared, which sometimes is called heat, microwaves, which are literally what come out of your microwave. Then we also have radio waves and then down in that same area, you also have TV waves. And this is literally what you would, what is used to transmit what you might listen to on the radio. How light is interacting with matter is depending on its energy, which we are going to see is dependent upon its frequency. What you need to know from this is the relative energies of the different types of light. So for example, you need to know that gamma rays are the highest energy. You need to know that x-rays are next in energy, then UV light, then visible light, infrared, microwave, and then radio waves are the lowest types of light, or the lowest energy types of light. So let's combine these two last two slides in a problem here. So you, we have a wave that's shown below, shown below, and we want to uh, know what color it is. Now, you look at this and you might think that it's uh, 
red just because of that, but that's just because we needed some color to represent it. What we want to do is look at the wavelength. All light, the color of light or the type of light is based upon the wavelength or frequency that it has. Um, this pie chart here will be given to you on the data sheet, which you can find on the ebook. So you can use that for our celebrations of knowledge. So let's first take a look at this. You might be tempted to take a look or to just use this value, 1.5 10 to minus 6 meters, as our wavelength. But we need to remember that a wavelength is not just the length that is shown, but it's represented by a full cycle of the wave. And we can see here that it goes completely over a trough or up a hill and down a trough, one full cycle, and that is one wavelength. Knowing that, we can see that the wavelength is actually that distance divided by three. That's 5.32 10 to the minus seven meters. And then using the conversion from meters to nanometers, we get that that's 532 nanometers. Now when you take a look then at your pie chart here, we just look and try and interpolate where that might end up. And we can see that 532 fits somewhere here in the green. And so the answer here is that it is green. Now, how would we have known if it was infrared light? Well, remember that when we look at energy, infrared light is uh, lower in energy or lower in frequency as well. It's lower in frequency than visible. And if you had just taken this distance, then that would have you would have gotten that that would be infrared light, if that was the wavelength. So let's talk a little bit more about properties of light. Max Planck was a uh, physicist, a scientist that lived um, around the turn of the 1900s. And he did research in what's called black body radiation. And what he uh, postulated and eventually proved was that light behaves as a particle. Now, this is contrary to what we just said, that light behaves as a wave. And you don't need to know the details of the experiment, but what you do need to know is that through his research in black body radiation, we now know that light behaves as a particle in the same way that a baseball behaves as a particle. It has um, energy associated with its movement, and it can hit things, and it can cause things to, to move around and to, to happen. Um, we see, because of his work, that energy is related to the frequency of light. This is the number of light particles And H is what we call Planck's constant. And you'll be given this equation as well as Planck's constant for any calculations. Albert Einstein um, later did some more work on light and using and studying what's called the photoelectric effect determined that light behaves as a particle as well. And so these two different um, studies, black body radiation showed that it behaves as a particle while it's being emitted, and the photoelectric effect showed that it behaves as a particle while it's being absorbed. And all of these get us to the idea that light has a dual nature, that it has both particle properties as well as wave-like properties. And so just to summarize all of this, we, we saw earlier that wavelength and frequency are related, that there's an inverse relationship. And so as wavelength increases, the frequency decreases. This equation we already saw. Again, you will be given the equation on your data sheet. You're given the, free, the speed of light constant. And you would just need to use it in some calculations. Now, how might you think about why wavelength and frequency are related. 
I like to use this analogy. Um, so one thing that we're told is that light must travel at the speed of light. So the speed of light is constant. And let's say that you have two people that are walking side by side at a constant speed. Someone with long legs and someone with short legs. If you've ever experienced this, you would know that the person with the long legs doesn't need to move their legs as frequently. They have a low movement of their legs to go the same distance. The person with the short legs they have to move their legs faster, more frequently. And so the kind of funny little thing I like to say here is that if you have um, a large leg length, there's a short frequency. In the same way that if you have a large wavelength, you would have a short frequency. So that's just a little funny uh, way to remember that. Um, we also know that as frequency increases, photon energy increases. And that's measured by this equation here. Again, this, this will be given to you on your data sheet. Same with Planck's constant, and you'll need to solve. So let's try and solve a problem there. So imagine you have a, a green laser pointer, and it's shooting out light at 532 nanometers. You want to know how much energy is there if there's one photon from this laser. Well, we know that energy is related to the wavelength and the number of photons, or excuse me, this is the frequency. We're not given the frequency, we're given instead the wavelength, but using this relationship, we can convert the wavelength to a frequency. So let me show you how this would be done. First step you could do is solve for the frequency by plugging in the speed of light and the wavelength. Notice that I've converted from nanometers to meters. When we do this, our units of meters will cancel out and we're left, left with units of inverse seconds. You'll see sometimes this is also referred to as Hertz, spelled H-E-R-T-Z. We can then take that frequency and plug it into our equation for energy. We know that there's one photon of light. Planck's, Planck's constant is, is given there. And then using the frequency, we can multiply those together. We are, our seconds and our inverse seconds cancel out. And we're left with 3.74 10 to the 19 minus 19 joules. And that's the energy of one single photon. Now, if we wanted to do this for two photons, we would multiply by two instead. If we were measuring 10 photons, we'd multiply by 10. If we were multi using one mole of photons, we would multiply by Avogadro's number, 6.022, 10 to the 23 per mole. In this case, this would be photons. Okay, so it doesn't matter what number of photons you have, you can always just modify this equation to deal with that. We could uh, do this, this type of calculation somewhat in reverse. So let's say that instead of wanting to know the energy, you're actually given the total energy. 
and you're given the wavelength. We want to know, in this case, how many photons there are. I would recommend pausing the video, trying this on your own, and then coming back and seeing if you got it right. Welcome back. Let's go through this together. We want to find out the number of photons. And so the way that we want to do this is relate energy to the number of photons. We can rearrange this and get that the number of photons. Oops, it's getting ahead of me now. The number of photons equals the energy time or over Planck, Planck's constant and the frequency. So we need to solve for our frequency. We're given the energy and we're given Planck's constant. So frequency we can find by taking the wavelength and converting it into from nanometers to meters and then uh, substituting in the into our equations. We're also going to convert from millijoules to joules. And the reason for these conversions is just to make sure that our uh, prefixes are accounted for. We can then take our wavelength, plug it into here, and solve for our frequency. Again, units uh, of meters will cancel out. We can find our frequency. And then using our rearranged equation for energy, we can plug in the frequency and our energy, Planck's constant. We see here that joules cancels with joules, seconds cancels with seconds, and that's equal to the number of photons that we have here. So the answer in this case is B. Now, uh, some of these other ones, if you had used the wrong, if you had not done your conversions properly, or if you had uh, used some of the wrong values here, you would have gotten some of these wrong answers. So something to pay attention to is that they're going to be distractors and you want to know how to uh, avoid choosing them, making sure that you're doing all the, the work properly and checking that your work makes sense. All right, the last thing we're gonna talk about today is spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the study of how light interacts with matter. So in other words, it's like saying, I, there's some, the light is literally shining on me right now. How does that light affect uh, my skin? And so someone studying that would be a spectroscopist. They would be using spectroscopy in order to do that. And there's three main types of phenomenon that we uh, think about in spectroscopy. One is transmission. One is reflection and one is emission. And all of these are different ways that light interacts with matter. And how we can tell what's going on is dependent on the type of matter that we have. So in this case, this is a glass of water. It's clear. In other words, you can see through it. When you have a clear substance, then light is transmitted through it. This is opposed to some substance that is opaque. An opaque substance is reflecting light back at you. And a substance that is uh, essentially glowing is um, emitting light. And so in these three different cases, light is behaving differently. It's interacting differently with matter. It's either passing straight through matter in some cases, or it's being reflected or it's being emitted on its own. And so what we, what we see is that the color observed, in this case, it's all green, but in a transmission, the green is passing through. The light's coming in and the green is passing through to hit our eyes and red light is being absorbed. In the case of the green paper, because it's opaque, the light is bouncing off of it and coming back to our eye but it's absorbing all the red light. In the case of the emission, it's leaving. The light is leaving the sample and coming to our eyes. And so we can use spectroscopy to study how light interacts. Uh, a basic spectrophotometer has a light source, a prism that divides the light up into its various colors, a sample that you're wanting to study, and that sample is going to absorb light at different wavelengths. It's going to have this absorption profile. What we see here 
is that it's absorbing light in the orange and red region. Um, and because that, it's transmitting the green light. And, we, and that's why it appears green to our eyes. When we do these studies, uh, you're going to need to understand how to tell uh, what type of light is being absorbed or not. And it uses a co complementary color absorption scheme. So if a su su substance appears blue, then whatever its complement is, with an E, is the color that it's absorbing most. And so let's say that you don't know what the solution's color is, but you see an absorption profile. We see here it's absorbing in the red, and we would say, okay, somewhere in the orange-red, it, it, it's absorbing, and so whatever color it appears must be whatever is the complement of that. Now, do you need to know the complements? No. Uh, you'll be provided on your data sheet a graph that looks, or a table that looks like this, and it illustrates for you. Now, complements are opposite of each other. Okay? So violet and yellow are complements, red and green are complements, and orange and blue are complements. So in this case here, it's absorbing light at about 630-ish nanometers. That's here. And so we would expect it to appear somewhere here in this blue color, which it does. This substance here appears red. And so we would expect it to be absorbing light in its complementary color, color scheme somewhere around here, between 490 and 560. When we look at what it absorbs, it indeed is absorbing light somewhere around 520 at, at its maximum, which makes sense. So you'll be expected to do something like this, given this type of a chart, and uh, understanding how the complementary color absorption works. So the last thing we're going to talk about is why you should even care about spectroscopy. Spectroscopy actually is really important to uh, much of what is happening in the modern world. So spectroscopy has been used and is still used to study the galaxy by astronomers. They use it, uh, that's how we discovered what elements the sun is made out of and what other um, stars that are in the universe are made out of. It's also been used to dis uh, when they were initially taught learning about the Doppler effect and the fact that the universe is expanding. Uh, scientists use, the, use spectroscopy to study the greenhouse effect and how climate is affected by it, uh, to look at the effect of pollutants in the air. Um, we also use it to study water quality. Um, it's used to examine acidity and minerals within water. It's used in pharmaceutical development. And it's also used within medical studies in actual uh, medical procedures to track uh, molecules within human cells based on how they interact with the light, various light components that are sent out. So hopefully that describes a little bit of uh, something for why anyone would be interested to know about spectroscopy and at least its significance. Thanks for watching today, and if you have questions, be sure to ask on Piazza or come to office hours. Have a good day.